Um, so first of all, I think Kelly, who, uh, you know, before we go live here, who uh, I'm Um, my picture is in front of who, so in this view here, can we uh, remove, uh, yourself so you don't yeah. are we ready then i roll the audio yep everybody sure hello and welcome to the 2021 summit of the social data lab it's a group of data and computer scientists cognitive scientists friends, many of them former students from Stanford and Berkeley, who took my courses about data and AI to bring people together. We do a summit every year. Last year was inspired by the many experiments I did with Clearview AI. 2019 was held in Bangkok and focused on deep fakes. Hello. What you just heard was a deep fake of my voice. Welcome to this social data summit. When I was thinking about what topic we should have this year, I came to the conclusion that data fears would be something interesting and related to what I've done in the past. But what are the fears we are talking about? Are the fears data appearing data that might not even exist, like what we just heard. By the way, that gives us a great opportunity to plausible deniability. Might it be data appearing that actually did exist? Let's say a recording which was made in the bedroom by somebody. Or would it be the fear that things disappear as a few years ago my entire YouTube channel disappeared. And Google had no way to create it back from some backup. So what are data fears? Data appearing, data disappearing. 
Or would it be, for example, the searches you do, say, on Pornhub? Or the friends you have on OnlyFans, which is one of the things which came out of my last year experience with Clearview AI. So data fears is the topic. And I'm very fortunate that as every year, I have a few dear friends who are helping me bring this on. And without much ado, I think I'd like to introduce Oliver Günther. Oliver and I met in the 70s at a summer school at the Fähren Akademie der Studienstiftung. We were both undergraduates in Karlsruhe. He then uh, went to the US to do his PhD at Berkeley and finished a couple of years before me, before I did mine at Stanford. Oliver was a professor in Santa Barbara, then in Germany, and now is the president of Potsdam University. And as the president of the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Informatik, the German um, Computer Science Society, he wrote a seminal paper where he, many years ago, was reflecting on data fears and on privacy. And we had truly many conversations in the more than half of our lives we've known each other. Oliver. Well, Andreas, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, welcome to my colleagues here on the panel and welcome to all of you out there listening to this. It's a wonderful topic. Uh, wonderful, not because it's always pleasant, but it's very interesting. Um, but it's not really a new topic, as we all know. Um, some people now think, oh, uh, why are all these bad things happening to the Internet right now? Uh, all this stuff that Andreas has been talking about. My question on the other hand, has always been, why did it take so long uh, for some weird things to happen? Um, because the systems have been brittle all along. And um, I think we were just lucky that we went through the last couple of decades without a major disaster stemming from our uh, use of the internet. I remember um, Andreas just talked about um, <clears throat> the 1980s. Um, in 1984, I moved from Castle to Berkeley um, my PhD advisor showed me my office at Berkeley, um, typical student office. And on the wall, there was a sheet of paper. It was a job or advertisement by an agency, uh, by a government agency whose name didn't really ring a bell with me. It was called um, National Security Agency. Um, so in 1984, the NSA was recruiting in Berkeley and they were uh, recruiting database specialists. Uh, now, they obviously knew what they were doing back then, but that's not um, the best part of the story. The best part is that some other student had scribbled a note on this uh, job advertisement, and it said, um, no need to send a resume. We already know everything about you. So that shows that back then in 1984, it was clear to many of us that some big thing is happening, and, and we have to kind of... Um, be careful not to let this go out of hand. And from 1984 until today, it's 36 years. Um, we muddled through fairly okay. Um, but now bad things start happening at a larger scale. The Russians are manipulating uh, the American elections through the internet. Uh, some private company decides whether the sitting or the former American president um, can uh, tweet or can, can put his announcements on, on Twitter or not. Um, energy systems are constantly being attacked. The whole grid is constantly under attack by hackers and uh, uh, blackouts have been happening as part of this tendency. So more and more bad things are happening. And uh, as we will hear later today, our privacy is more than ever uh, in danger. So this is a time to really think politically um, and make sure that our politicians and everybody who has something to say in society addresses these issues head on. Why hasn't this happened? Because technology has moved so fast. I'm a computer scientist myself. I'm proud of what we computer scientists have done, but um, the public policy politicians had no chance to really follow this fast progress and really put in the regulations uh, we need. So that's why I'm now today um, 
um, definitely arguing for more government regulation. I don't think private initiative itself will suffice. These government regulations are needed to make sure that the internet, the IT we use um, really is being made available to us that serves the public good. And the public good may vary greatly between different countries. I'm glad we are very international today on the panel. Uh, the Chinese people and or the Chinese government probably has very different ideas how uh, the IT uh, tools that we have should be put into service than we in Germany. And that is again maybe different from even France and certainly different from the United States. But uh, politics is now really um, needed uh, to come up with public policy guidelines. So the wonderful technology we have is really put to a wonderful use and not only being abused, uh, but also used as a possible weapon. Thank you for now. Norbert Schwartz also was born in Germany and did his undergraduate uh, nearby Karlsruhe where Oliver and I was in Mannheim. Then came to the US, a uh, long time taught in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and now is a professor at USC. He studies consumer behavior. I almost misspoke and said computer behavior. No, consumer yes. behavior. And particularly is interested about the question on revealed preferences versus stated preferences, meaning what actually do people do compared to what do they say they do? Norbert Schwartz. Hello, everybody. Well, I mean, when you think about data fears, when you ask people if they're concerned about their data and the privacy of their data, the answer is straightforward. Yes, uh, people are. When you look at their behavior, the answer is less clear. So on the one hand, they report that they're concerned, but it only shows up in behavior in some domains and not in others. So let's look at that. Uh, and I think where it shows up and doesn't show up tracks to some extent what the industry interests are. So the areas where people are really concerned, the big one is identity theft, which is more or less about protecting your bank account, making sure that nobody else goes shopping with your credit card, that nobody gets a loan in your name and so on. That's also aligned with the interest of your bank. And you get enough reminders of that, that you eventually are reasonably good at protecting your PIN and your password and some other such things. A second area where people are relatively cautious is health information. Uh, but mostly uh, when they really have a reason to worry about their health and their concerns that their employer may somehow find out that they may be the less than ideal employee if they have a chronic illness or if they have some other uh, issues that may eventually come up. The third domain uh, is nothing outside. It's not uh, your online behavior. It's really protecting your reputation vis-a-vis -vis your own network and friends. And people are quite good at protecting access to their computer on the nasty stuff that they don't want their spouses to see. So they know how to use an incognito mode uh, so that their spouse won't find out their porn sites and the kids won't see some other weird hobbies. Uh, but at the same time, they don't seem to care that despite their incognito mode, they internet provider and many others along the way, of course, know uh, where they came from. So uh, those are areas in which discrepancies start showing up. And the biggest discrepancies are in the areas that you can describe as tracking. So people know that the online activities are tracked, but they do not seem to understand that the individual bits and pieces on many different apps, on many different sites, are linked together, are bundled, and that these bundles are sold and allow inferences that go way beyond anything that you explicitly shared. They allow profiles that provide information that is beyond the scope of the relatively harmless thing that you think you just uh, no, put in there. 
privacy protection in that area is not in the industry's interest. Uh, many, many uh, companies uh, have that as an explicit business model. That is their business and the user is a product. And uh, there are no reminders of that, that, hello, you're tracked, be careful, or any other such thing that really emphasizes uh, the extent to which you're giving away more than you know. In fact, uh, most of that information is now leaked by your cell phone. And the cell phone is ideally, the mobile phone is ideally suited uh, to allow for that. On the one hand, uh, it gives you a high degree of service and comfort. I mean, you're using Google Maps and it helps you get to places, yet at the same time, it tracks everything where you were. Uh, and your cell phone also increasingly allows for an interaction that looks like normal interactions. You speak to your app, your app knows what you like, your app helps you to get it. And sharing some information is, of course, necessary for getting what you want. And again, what you're missing is this additional piece of the linking and sharing. And finally, says one domain in which the worries are very large, but the answers and how you deal with them are, is not clear. And that's the area of government surveillance. And people on the one hand are very concerned about this. It shows up in many conspiracy theories, like the recent beliefs about COVID-19, where you know, people assume that the vaccine includes a microchip that allows the global government to track you. Uh, and so on. And these kinds of concerns show up in, in many different ways, not all as bizarre as a microchip in the vaccine. And <clears throat> last observation on that, and I think that the health concerns and the surveillance concerns come together in what uh, arguably is one of, is at the moment one of the dysfunctional aspects of the fear of being tracked, which is a limited use of the tracking apps for COVID-19. So those are apps that uh, you know, would alert you if you were in contact, in close enough contact with someone who turns out to be positive. But multiple pieces come together here. It has a flavor of government surveillance. It pertains to health information, which makes you wary anyway. And uh, it has this fantasy that your phone obviously leaves traces on some other phone uh, that all communicates with your Bluetooth. So that's another uh, a tricky piece in that. And what you're going to learn from that app is potentially bad. And COVID itself is fear eliciting. And I leave you as a last example with a little study that we did not in this uh, pandemic, but in a previous pandemic that turned out not to be that bad, which was a swine flu pandemic of 2009. And it illustrates how fear in one domain spills over in other domains. So at that time, we did a little experiment in the streets of Ann Arbor, Michigan, a little Midwestern college town. And we asked people how high the risk is that they would get sick this fall, that they would get a heart attack before they're 60, and uh, that they would die of crime. And just as they answered this question, a guy walks by who does or does not sneeze. And sneezing was a transmission vector for swine flu at that, at that time. And what we found was uh, very straightforward. Uh, yes, when somebody sneezes, your fear that you might get sick this fall goes up as it should, it reminds you of a real health threat. But so did the fear that you would die of heart attack before you're 60, which is completely unrelated, and the fear that you would die of crime, which is also completely unrelated. And what it illustrates is that risk perceptions are very much gut-based. And if there is a signal that the world is a dangerous place, that something is scary, then everything is scary. The world becomes a dangerous place. And I think all of these play together now in what you might describe as um, a contribution to a global health risk uh, to which data fear contributes its own part. And I'll stop here. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Norbert. Lisa Lin.
and I met when we both lived in Shanghai. Lisa is coming out with a book called Surveillance State, jointly with Josh Chin, who was last year one of the speakers at the Social Data Summit. Lisa is calling in from Singapore. And I really appreciate that you as a reporter, keeping on track of everything, are able to uh, make time at this late time of the night. Lisa. Thank you. Thank you so much. And those are really good speeches beforehand as well, uh, Oliver and Robert. I, <laughs> I have to admit, when Josh told me uh, this was a good event, to speak on and to go ahead with it, I didn't look at the time <laughs> in the email. So I said, yes, I'll do it. And after me being the muddle-headed me, I looked, at, I looked at the time difference and it was two and I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, so just as a quick introduction, I work for the Wall Street Journal and I've been a reporter covering Asia, which is a region with very different privacy attitudes um, from the rest of the world. Uh, I've been covering this region for more than 10 years and the bulk of this has been in China. Uh, what really fascinates me about the topic data fears is uh, the control of data. Who has control of that data and how do they use it? You know, do they use it in a nefarious way or can they use it in more positive ways? And it's interesting to me that, as Norbert had already pointed out, you know, digital surveillance by the state is here to stay and it's not going away. So how can we, as a population, maximize its benefits while reducing the downside of government surveillance? So that's probably one of the big questions I would like to ask the panel today as well. Um, and, and I guess be, before I turn it all over to the next speaker, I want to talk about, I want to bring you guys back to last January, last February, winter of 2020. And imagine you are in Wuhan, uh, which was where we found the first few cases of the coronavirus. Uh, it was by the time the Chinese government had figured out the coronavirus would be as infectious and as deadly as it was, it had run into the Chinese New Year season. And for people who don't know China very well, the Chinese New Year season is typically a season where most of the country is on the move. They call it the Great Migration because students and workers who are working away from their hometowns all go back to their hometowns. So the train stations are flooded, the airports are flooded, there's just so many people moving. By the time the Wuhan and the central government found out that the coronavirus was infectious and they needed to close Wuhan off, it, it was too late. Thousands, hundreds and thousands of people had already left Wuhan in the run up to Chinese New Year, en route back to their hometown to meet with the parents or the extended family you know, celebrate Chinese New Year. So what did China do in that situation? China did something that was very, very unprecedented. China mobilized the use of its state-run telecom carriers. They got the telecom carriers to provide them with the list of people who had left the city just before they closed the city, the city borders. So your state-run telco companies such as China Mobile, China Unicom, they, they compiled lists and dossiers of the names of people who had left. Because in China, in order, to get, in order to get a cell phone number, you have to have the ID card linked to that cell phone number. So with every cell phone number, they know who you are, they know what's your ID number, they know where you registered that from. Um, so the telco carriers, using a combination of both GPS tracking and triangulation, managed to narrow down the people who had left Wuhan. In that situation, the Chinese government then sent the data down to local authorities who gave these people calls and told them to quarantine themselves. Uh, and the people who had left Wuhan quarantined themselves for two weeks. In, in this situation, it really shows you the heft of the Chinese surveillance state and what China is willing to do 
when it comes to applying digital surveillance tools to managing any sort of problem, be it a public health crisis or a human rights issue in Xinjiang. Uh, so uh, I'll close it by saying that COVID has, COVID has opened up um, many more avenues for data collection in the name of public health. And I feel like co the coronavirus has, is testing the long held assumption that state surveillance is inherently bad because as we can have seen in several Asian countries, Taiwan, China, Seoul, Hong Kong, Singapore included, many of the governments here utilized some sort of surveillance or a loss of privacy in order to keep the pandemic in check. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. It really truly is a dilemma. It is not black and white. And uh, having been advisor to Angela Merkel on digital matters, member of the Digital Rat, uh, I'm very aware that politicians really are trying to do the right thing. But as with any true dilemma, it is not really clear what the right thing is. Dave Holtzman. And I met in the 90s when I was working for a company he had, which was interested in identity. He then was working for me at Amazon. And we have been become friends. Uh, I think I've probably stayed at five houses you have had so far. And uh, Dave also used to work for the NSA. So he used to hang out in submarines outside Russia. He's fluent in Russian um, and has also some interesting thoughts about data fears. More importantly, she wrote a book many, many years ago, which I've used in my teaching in China. So the book must have come out 2001 or 2002 called Privacy Lost, where many of the things I didn't see, he saw. David Holtzman. Well, thank you, Andreas. Um, I actually invented some terms like sock puppet in that book, which is just as a side note. So I think the message I'm going to give is I'll make perhaps a little bit different. So I, I think that the, we are not at the end of data interoperability. I think we are in the middle and it's hard to guess what that means. And what I mean by that is there's been a lot of IT money and work has gone over the last several decades have gone into increasing interoperability between databases through standards bodies and just through necessity. There's an end game there. And the end game is when there's a uh, essentially a universal database, when all information is, is fundamentally interoperable. So then the question becomes, uh, you know, there'll be different, you know, MLA, multiple levels of access, but what happens then? Because that's the world I'm worried about. Uh, I believe that the fear of data, which is the topic today, it's directly related to identity. I don't think people care quite so much if you know what books I bought, probably, or what kind of food I eat, but if it starts to hit me viscerally on who I am or who I think I am, I think it becomes more of a problem. And that's what I dealt with in my book, Privacy Lost. Um, I also think the fear of privacy is a generational one. I think people that are baby boomers, uh, that are over 50, maybe over 60, their fear is of being discovered, having their uh, part of their identity outed. I think when you get to Gen Z and millennials, I think the fear is the fear of being ignored. Um, TikTok is a perfect social medium forum for people who do not want to disappear in, in the world. And, and that's what's happening. I've seen this happen with me in Wiki, Wikipedia and Google, um, where all of a sudden every year I, you know, I get to the bottom of a hit page when you search for me, and then page two, and then I publish something, and then I'm on page one again. And, and th you know, that's what I'm going through, but I'm sure other people are going through their own version of that. Um, I've seen, uh, I was also CTO of Network Solutions back in the 90s and I ran the domain name system and we started seeing huge lawsuits and lots of controversy involving domain names, which of course is also identity. 
uh, when the Star, uh, fourth Star Wars movie, for The Phantom Menace, came out, we got, uh, they got into some trouble because they had reserved domain names for a number of characters, which if you put all the names together, uh, revealed some of the plot twists that were coming out in the movie. And that's when I first started realizing how important that could be. Uh, in my own life, I've seen two cases, one my father-in-law who was adopted and we put his uh, record into 23andMe and we found who his family, the actual birth family was in about 48 hours. And I know another case where that happened except it was the reverse and someone who thought someone was their natural father actually was not their natural father. So this keeps going back into identity again. And going to uh, some of the earlier comments about the value and the fault uh, and the flaws and, and damage caused by technology, I would point to what's going on in the United States right now. Uh, we had this horrible insurrection on our Capitol building on January 6th, and they've caught several hundred people. They've caught them all from technology because they went on social media and put pictures saying, you know, here's me wearing uh, horns on my head invading the Capitol building or some other dumb thing like that. Uh, they got them through airplane records, uh, social media, traffic cameras, the cameras at the Capitol building itself. So, you know, arguably that's a good thing. Uh, but on the other side of that, you know, I, I don't think it's controllable anymore. I used to think it was, I no longer believe in regulation of data. Um, I believe in transparency of data. I think governments tend to be, frankly, I, I'm sure a lot of, I know Andreas has dealt with many politicians. I find politicians to be uh, not Luddites exactly, but not, a, you know, they have trouble getting an iPhone to work. So these are the people writing the laws and the laws are retrospective. Uh, for instance, you know, airplane security is still dealing with, you know, shoe bombs, which were found 10 years ago. They don't anticipate, they look backwards which makes them inherently uh, unable to deal with this fast moving, moving interest uh, industry. So I think I will sum up with one last point, which is the only thing I'm particularly worried about with data is what I call inferential data. And that was my conclusion in privacy laws. Um, I'm not too worried about uh, identification of a fact. I get very worried when the wrong fact is attributed. Uh, that seems to be happening a lot right now, and it's clearly just going to get worse unless there's a universal database and everybody has access to it, which I think is also terrifying. So I think that's the conundrum, and I do have some thoughts on a solution, but I'll hold that till later. So thank you. Thank you, Dave. Yes, indeed. Uh, the question about wrong data being out in the world about you. I didn't mention it when I just talked about data disappearing or other data appearing, but very difficult to deal with that. I had an identity theft a couple of years ago that, you know, as it was mentioned before, somebody tried to open a new bank accounts, credit cards, etc., under my name. And then I was on a flight and I called my assistant from the airport, Denver, so checking planes. And Rocky said, Andreas, they now broke into the Amazon account and changed the password. Can you please do something about it so they are not shipping lots and lots of expensive computers somewhere in South Central LA? So I think the experience of having experienced a data theft or an identity theft and having had to rebuild everything was actually making me aware of some of the fears I have about data. A couple of comments before I open up the conversation for the people on the panel to talk to each other. 23andMe was mentioned. My Stanford classes always were live recorded because I believe in really making knowledge accessible. And it's actually quite interesting to, to me to see what COVID is doing to the some people might even say Ponzi scheme, a university like Stanford are running by showing that a class there taught by somebody who has other stuff to do is not necessarily any better than a class at a university which is not well known at all where the person puts their passion into the teaching. So I had in the very early days of 23andMe, I had one of these test tubes 
spit in it at home, sent it in. And then I was thinking about opening the email which I got in class. And there I chickened out because I was worried if there was something negative about my DNA, I don't want that to persist on Stanford continuing in professional learning the for fee uh, extra courses basically forever when the robots of the future come and analyze what my classes were about. Then for Norbert, I remember that when you were advising my company Shop Market, that we happened to talk about dating sites and I quoted from my work, from the work I did with Match.com that a very high number of people in the United States seem to be on dating sites. And I don't know whether you remember that you went to your computer administrator in Michigan and said, hey, dude, do me the favor. Check out how many of my colleagues were on Match.com or one of them. And indeed, the number was in the 70s which you explained that, well, maybe they clicked on the link by mistake, which brings me back to the plausible deniability. Um, I think uh, I would like to open up and maybe her share if you have a question for the panel or now I think I had the half hour where people could make their statements. We have about 20 minutes left uh, where I would say 15, we should talk among each other and then take some questions from the audience. As you know, it's uh, live streamed on YouTube. Uh, why don't I just simply step back and you guys have a discussion about what you found interesting, what other people might have said. Just think, think about it as a dinner table where I'm not going to say it's your turn now. Well, can I say something to David? Okay, um, well, um, I think it, it was you who said um, politicians, they have trouble using their iPhones. Well, then we have to help them. We, um, we experts have to help politicians. Uh, first, we have to uh, vote for the right politicians. Okay, that's already problem number one. But then we have to help them write these laws. I think this is uh, something where we, as scientists, we are responsible for using our brains, regardless whether we are computer scientists or sociologists or psychologists, to advise politicians to do the right thing. And what is the right thing? The right thing is a public good in that particular cultural and natural context. That, that right thing is different, as I said before, in China versus Germany versus France versus the US, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but um, we in Germany right now, uh, I'm not I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm a member of another party than Angela Merkel, but I think we're still blessed by her because she listens, she's a scientist herself, she listens to crazy people like Andreas uh, and tries to make sense and then turn that into a decent legislation. That takes time, uh, but I think it's too early to give up. Well, I, I appreciate that position and I think if I were a German, I would probably feel more optimistic than I do as an American. And as an American, I would probably feel better if we just hadn't come out of four years of Donald Trump, um, where we had an administration who did not listen to scientists, uh, even about something that just killed half a million people in America. And probably half of those half a million could have been averted with to just some common sense stuff. So the, the reason I said that is because the kind of things we're talking about are what I would say our nuances of technology and data. And I've spent a lot of time with US politicians living in Washington DC, and I've been asked to come in and brief them on a whole lot of things. And they're not dumb when it comes to the law and policy, but unlike Angela Merkel, they're not scientists, most of them in, our, in my country. And the other problem, again, and this is a uniquely American issue, is because of our fundraising problems Politicians need to raise an enormous amount of money, and right now they're getting it from corporations, so they tend to defer to the corporate interest. I, it's certainly not true in Singapore, and I'm pretty sure that's not true in Germany. So I'm cynical. I guess I'm cynical. I was almost 
Hello, Heinz Schwer. I would almost uh, agree to that uh, some level of cynicism. And we are actually doing in consumer lending. So we uh, have credit decisions based on data. So we have lots of data which we uh, have on a customer. We uh, can instantaneously decide on, on, on loan. And uh, customers know about that. And in, in the European Union, we have a le legislation which entitles consumers to go to a company and say, hey, guys, I, I want to know exactly what data you keep on me and what do you need it for? And th that law is, uh, is it's, it's not hidden. It uh, was con kind of well communicated. Uh, people are aware of that. We have uh, uh, roughly 700,000 uh, customers who have loans with us. And uh, now you can guess how many of those customers in the last year went to us and said, hey, guys, I have this right. And now I want to see what data is stored on me. You can all kind of guess how, how big that number is. I didn't know it uh, uh, until yesterday. I just asked a couple of guys to find it out in our bank. And the number is four. Four out of 700,000 uh, consumers last year decided that they came to our bank and said, OK, I have a right to see what, what data you, you store on me. And now you need to show it to me. Yeah? The, the other uh, 700,000 consumers, obviously, they didn't care. Because we can just think about why they, are they not fearful, or they don't care, or they don't understand it. But I'm very skeptical that any regulator can come up with things which are up to date. I, I believe uh, I would support the view that it's always regulators are one or two steps behind and they come up with stuff which is just outdated when it's in the market. It's the same with kind of when you go to an internet site, they have to make you aware of that they use cookies and so forth, but consumers just don't care. They just click on this thing to move on. Yeah? And so, so I would be very skeptical that any regulator can come up with, with stuff which is uh, up to date. I found this extremely interesting that uh, this data point you just had, that only four people, only four people actually asked for their data. And you know why it's not more? And the year before, I was afraid. Before, it was five. It was five in 2019, five uh, customers. And in the year 2020, it was four customers. Because nobody wants to be confronted with the, with the loss of control there um, that have been gone through. And if you ask and then you see what you know about me, I feel even more vulnerable. And I suffer much even more from the loss of control I'm already experiencing. And loss of control is always uh, difficult to digest. I mean, the psychologists know better. Um, and uh, But we all have to deal with that. And we have to, uh, I think Elisa said earlier, that is also a question as to whom you lose control. Do you lose control to a private party uh, or to a government? And is the government a good government or a bad government? And I think we have to play with those categories uh, to define what is the public good in a particular context. And what kind of loss of control is not only acceptable, but good because it helps other causes like uh, pursuing criminals. There's yeah, one thing actually loss of control the other thing is that we realize that we only had that illusion of control and i think one of the roots of data fears is that it precisely brings to the foreground that illusion of control we have not only our personal data but if you think about data in an organization, I've done many workshops with companies around the world where we tried to have them a more data-centric organization, more data-driven decisions. And one of the barriers I again can is that people feel that somebody else might find something out about the data 
that I created, my organization created, which doesn't make me look good. So that illusion of control or that loss of control, I think, is an important problem in digitization, in getting data accepted in companies and, in my experience with Germany, also government. Well, a very practical thing on what you just said, Andreas. So I was talking before about how databases are all sort of converging. Um, they're converging, I didn't mention this, but they're not relational databases. They're converging on blockchain-based databases, which any record committed to a blockchain from a technical viewpoint is fundamentally undeletable. So as, these, as we transition to these kinds of technologies for data, the GDPR, for instance, in the European Union would be, will be completely unworkable because the right to be forgotten will not be enforceable. Yeah, great point. We actually discussed last year at the last uh, Social Data Summit, which was in Bangkok, um, we discussed a few things around blockchain. And uh, like everywhere, there are different aspects to it. One of them is the immutable aspect that you can't change it, meaning well, if you fake something, you better fake it before you write it onto the blockchain. End of advice. And the other one, of course, is the decentralized version that you don't have one copy which you can nuke off, but it is all over the place. Yeah. Uh, interesting there also was, and the link is on socialdatalab.com, uh, that we had a company from Singapore, Vision Group, and they gave very many good use cases for data fears, including food safety, food provenance. Do we really know where something comes from? And one of the stories we heard was that about 60% of the wine in the People's Republic of China is fake, is not by DNA what it says it is. So for having covered China, I, I probably believe you. The bulk of the wine in China is made by mixing bad quality wine taken from Spain uh, or Portugal and mixing it with bad quality wine from China domestically because the wine production there is just so little. So they mix it up, they bottle it and they resell it. So yes, I completely believe you. Um, for me, I have a question for Dave as well, uh, and to follow up uh, on what on Oliver's point, uh, you mentioned data transparency as a solution instead of regulation of data. I mean, what specific measures would you want to see taken to get to that data transparency? And can you really trust the corporates to well, be can I, can, transparent can, data? <laughs> Andreas, may I be a little uh, controversial? Absolutely. Um, How else would you okay, believe? So, so I, I, I'll tell you what I actually believe. I believe in vigilanteism, and I believe that citizen hackers, black hatters, and other people will hold corporations accountable to transparency because if they don't do it, they'll break in, take the stuff, and put it out in the net. And there's a, a big history of this. And it's the, the governments keep making laws against this, but people keep finding ways around it. I believe that's the solution. I don't trust corporations and I don't trust governments and I've worked for both of them. I have, I have a lot of faith uh, in, um, in people working together in society. I mean, Wikipedia, things like that. It's just a, a lot of people that work together for the social good. And I believe that that will keep everybody on the up and up and honest. So I want to show you four props here. This device I bought okay, for my godson in Singapore before he was born. It's a GPS logger. And I simply wanted his parents to every now and then charge the battery. And then when he turns 16, just give it to him as a present. But the parents realize that, well, it won't only be where he is, but it will also be where they are. And that was the end 
of that GPS loader. Well, second prop I find extremely useful, for example, when I'm on the train in Germany. When I push this button, so it is a jammer. It just kills the phone conversations around you. And uh, more than once did I see it in, a, you know, in one of these compartments in front of people who had these never ending phone calls. I think some of you can relate and you just. So, uh, of course, highly illegal. I have an industrial strength version in my condo in Bangkok, uh, but I don't want to bring this on the plane. If by mistake it comes on, it could be actually bring the plane down. Um, uh, so those are sort of vigilante ways to protect yourself. I've also used it in the classroom. Uh, if people are sort of have this temptation to do other things while uh, I'm teaching, pushing that button and sort of the phones go dead and I tell them about it helps the students to really focus in the class. I guess that's vigilante behavior is along the lines of David's philosophy. Um, I mean, uh, as you guys know, uh, I wrote this book, Data for the People, out of my belief that we as individuals need to have rights. And those come in two flavors, rights to see, transparency rights, like to see my data, even if only five people or four people a year ask SKP for that, and the right to see what the refineries are doing with my data. There's a lot of, I think, mediocre literature on bias in algorithms. I'm very happy to have that conversation with whoever is interested in about that. And the second group of rights are the rights, what we can do with our data to annotate them, to port them, etc. So I really do believe that the data of the people and by the people need to be data for the people. Yeah. We have about 10 minutes left. So I would like, and I don't have any grand ending planned, but I would like to make sure that maybe we go around once and uh, if people have a point they wanted to make and didn't get in, that this would be the time to actually make it. And then, uh, Maybe we have also some questions from the audience, which I don't see, but I think we should go around people reflecting on what they learned, what they found interesting, and then see whether we take one or two audience questions. Is that okay? So, Lisa, why don't we start with Lou? This is a case of ladies first, I guess. <laughs> Um, I, I guess when we talk about regulation, something popped up in my head, and I, I wonder if this is probably worth bringing up. There is always this impression of China as a place that doesn't care about, you know, data rights. Uh, I have to say that there should be a distinction made uh, on 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 the front of like personal data protection and personal data protection from corporates, China is actually moving forward and they are making some moves that I feel are even more ahead of the US. Uh, although, you know, it doesn't take very much to be ahead of the US in terms of privacy regulation at this point. Um, I, I would like I to mention that, that China- Do you believe them? Do you really think so? Let me put it this way. Uh, I was at Tencent headquarters two years ago just before a Wall Street Journal conference actually in Hong Kong. And a friend of mine, uh, you know, really shared what's going on in Tencent. 
and he's now here in the US, just finished his degree at CMU. And based on the conversations there, my hope that um, there is some protection when there are questions about government was completely crushed. I think China, the purpose of data is to support the government. In the US, it's to support companies. And I have the hope that in Europe, it is still support the citizen. So I'm not sure whether I trust the Chinese. So I guess this is why we have to draw a distinction between protection from the government and protection from corporates. If we're talking about a personal a, a person's data and this person's protection from the government, no, I, I don't actually think this law will do very much for it. Um, the law has a clause that if you were a government agency, you have to take the necessary steps in order to in order to to find or to you know dig into the person. Um, but at the same time, there's a caveat that under the national security for national security reasons, you could still dig into this person's data and not have to ask for informed consent. So I, I do think when we're talking about state surveillance, I think the, the law will be relatively toothless, um, similar to many other laws that would probably uh, be subservient to the national security law. But I think when it comes to surveillance for corporations, China does want to do the right thing. Um, just in, in the US, you know, it, the same problems that US regulators and US authorities are facing at this point with big tech and data collection, the Chinese people are also facing. Um, and imagine this is a country of 850 million internet users. Everyone's on their smartphones. Imagine the amount of data they're generating. Um, the Chinese government knows that it has had a problem with data abuses in the past and data breaches as well. And it does want to fix that, at least on the corporate side. Does that make sense? And so whenever I talk to Lisa, I feel a little bit like in Chat House. I think it's called Chat House. Chat House. Chat House. Chat House. Uh, uh, because I religiously read everything Lisa writes. Like, where is Jack Ma? There was a whole Facebook group, uh, WeChat group, which we started based on your article. Or, of course, all of your TikTok discussion. Uh, but then, uh, you know, it's uh, like almost a voyeuristic thing that I know the things you are thinking about because you're cranking out stuff almost every day versus you, of course, have no idea of what, what I'm thinking about. That's the really sort of clubhouse idea that, wow, I was in the same room with Elon Musk. I heard his voice. By the way, if anybody wants to buy my Tesla 3, I want to get rid of it. But that's, that's, that's the point. So China is complex uh, and... Um, I should shut up Nuance. and give up a chance to talk. Yeah, but if I can follow up on Lisa, I mean, uh, let's face yeah. it, China is doing a great job. Um, China is doing a great job regulating IT in a way that the government wants it. Now, the problem for us, we, maybe for some of you also, is that China is not a democracy. It's an oligarchy, or if you want, a dictatorship. But <clears throat> the People, the guys, uh, it's only men, the guys in power are very good in uh, shaping legislation and, of course, uh, executive power and police force um, get exactly out of IT what they want. And we are not nearly as good uh, as, as China is, partly because we are democracies, and democracies are much harder to run than dictatorships when you're the dictator. Um, but uh, and this is going to be um, my final statement, if you want. I just want to review my call to arms uh, for getting the right politicians uh, into power. Um, so we have to vote for them and then um, enabling them to really uh, do uh, what the public could dictate. I'm not um, ready to, uh, I know it was provocative, but I'm not ready to resort to vigilantism yet. That's not the solution. Norbert. 
I'm sitting here wondering if we can get more data on uh, European citizens actually using the right to access the data and to learn about that. Uh, and to what extent uh, this very low usage rate, which was so low, I, I, even I was surprised. I thought, well, 700,000, you probably get about 700, <laughs> 700 requests, which wouldn't be much, but a four really struck me. Uh, and I wonder, uh, all those four are people who you rejected and didn't give a loan to, or uh, are people, uh, have, do people have that little interest in it because you're actually the bank they trust and you did them good by giving them the loan and so there's nothing to worry about from you? Are there other companies that they would want to know more from? And what can we learn about from this kind of data? about the things that really get people sufficiently wired to care about their data and to support transparency. I mean, any measures that you put in as a, as a legal option for more transparency is completely useless if people don't care and don't use it. You can be very transparent and then just let it sit there. Uh, nobody looks anyway. And similarly, the idea that, you know, the vigilantes will take care of that, well, at some level, uh, but again, which company cares about this? Um, I mean, the big ones would, because they might plausibly become targets of vigilante attacks, but many other places simply won't. I mean, the odds are extremely low that vigilantes will go after you. So I'm a little uh, uh, skeptical how helpful either the, the policy moves or the hope for vigilante control um, actually works. Yeah, thank you. I know, Norbert, you have a lab Come meeting on, yeah. have to drop out now. What I would like to have as a final question to everybody else is inspired what Norbert has said. How can we give people hope. So what can we do, us living in Western states, plus Singapore, what can we do to give people hope? Hope about data. So how can we move from data fears, which we talked about, to data hopes? That's the last question. And I would like people to reflect for a moment and then end on that. Well, come up with good stories. I mean, we have Corona right now. Um, we have a Corona app in Germany. Um, it's been castrated because of uh, privacy and data protection concerns. Um, if we had um, a, a tool that would use data responsibly and fight COVID, that, that's the kind of story we need um, to show that the advantages outweigh the disadvantages as long as uh, um, the framework, as long as the framing conditions, uh, legislation, etc., cetera, are, are right. Oliver, you run a major university. Uh, how, how many students are in Potsdam? 22,000. 22,000 students. What do you see that faculty can do to give today's students hope about their future from a data perspective? Uh, teach them data literacy, um, teach them privacy literacy, and help them, and, and I do not only talk about the computer science guys, but uh, every one of these 22,000 students, help them to use the wonderful technology that we have to the best um, of possible, uh, in the best possible ways. Yeah, data literacy, and also good term, privacy literacy. Thank you, Oliver. Dave, well, how can we I hope people? So 
each each century, roughly, we have new uh, economic drivers. You know, they were uh, the pre-industrial age. It was raw materials and resources. The industrial age, it became more about skilled labor. Uh, intellectual property came into being as being an asset. I think data is the um, it's the it's the currency of the future, and I think what's especially valuable is going to be creative content, data that comes from the human mind, because a corporation can buy that, but they can't create that. And that means the people fundamentally control tomorrow's oil fields and coal mines, because the, the equivalent of that is, is becoming, you know, you look at all the streaming video and the movies, and um, intellectual property, patents, algorithms, uh, even some of the dumb TikTok videos, it's still coming from the human mind. And people are gonna have to learn how to control data because they're making money out of it. And as more and more of that happens and it gets baked into more and more places in our, our cultures, um, I think there'll be a great awakening of the value of data and how it needs to be protected and used. And I think the pandemic is actually causing that to happen right now. Thank you. Hershey, you I think determine the fates and the credits of hundreds of thousands of people, you as CEO. How can you give people hope? I think uh, people right now appreciate what data kind of availability, how it helps them do things they never could do before. Yeah, I mean, like our customers, they can sit on a sofa at home and get a loan within just a couple of minutes. And they know that we know a lot about them and they know that uh, the data is available to us and they know that's the basis uh, for, for us giving a, them a loan in, instantaneously. So, and they can do lots of things which was before unimaginable. Yeah? So in that sense, uh, hope is reality because it helps lots of, uh, of people right now. And there's, in, in that sense, there's an kind of too little data fear almost. Yeah? And what, what's just uh, crossed my mind before is that because our whole society becomes completely dependent on the availability of data and the trust we have in that data, one could easily destabilize the whole world, basically, if one destroys the credibility of data. Let's assume just for a second that somebody steals the data of 700,000 customers, I'm sure that there is very kind of uh, bad stuff out there which people wouldn't like to see on the open market. Yeah, And in that split second, not only four customers would like to see what we have on them, but probably 4,000, yeah? and probably they would, wouldn't want to use it. Yeah, So as soon as somebody gets control of this data, then basically a terrorist could more or less uh, kind of destabilize the whole world if they kind of attack the integrity of data. That's not the message of hope. I think we do lots of good things with data and people appreciate it, but it's also we, we are exposed to extreme dangers that never were existed in that way before. Yeah? And I, I don't have an answer to that, to be honest. So before giving Lisa the final word on her sharing her hopes with us, I would like to thank two people. Right there, if we can go back to her share. In the background, there we have Lars sitting up. Lars, I would like to thank you because without you, this wouldn't have happened. And on my side, Kelly, can I ask you to come up and come into the camera? And I want to thank you for making this happen from our side here. So this is Kelly. And over there is Lars. Thank you. And now 
Lisa Lin's final word of hope. Wrap this up. Um, and I guess my answer is going to be very idealistic, but please forgive me, I am a journalist. Uh, I, I think what gives people hope is to have functioning democracies, to have checks and balances, firstly, to prevent data abuses, so people are more confident in putting data out there. And secondly, you know, to take the lead on regulation, to set a consistent global standard on how to handle data right. Uh, I, I look at things very much through the lens of tech-driven authoritarianism, which is what we're seeing in China right now. And that feeds off the failings of democracies elsewhere. Uh, the best way, in my opinion, to control that tech-driven authoritarianism, um, to make things in, for, for certain groups in China more positive, I feel it, the best way is we need a functioning democracy. Thank you all. Bye-bye.